But this morning we're going to look at Psalm 119, beginning in verse 25 through verse 32. And at the first reading of this passage, immediately my thoughts were different than what I what I think the psalmist is writing in this passage. We start in verse 25 when he says, my soul clings to the dust. And when I see that kind of phrase, I automatically think of the grave. And maybe because uh, from dust we were formed and dust we will return. And oftentimes in scripture, that phrase is used to, to talk about death. But that's not what the psalmist is saying here. There are one or two ways that this could be interpreted. One is either... Um, he's, he's on his deathbed and he's clinging to death, or the other way, which I think in context is what the psalmist is writing, is that, that my soul clings to dust, or my soul clings to lower things, my soul clings to, uh, to earthly things. And I think it's a sense that all of us feel at some time. I, I do on occasion. I feel as though um, that spiritually, not that I go into gross or deep sin, but, but spiritually, my soul is, is pursuing or going after those lowly things, things, that, um, things that, that, that are not in themselves evil or bad, but, but just where my heart might be clinging to earthly things rather than uh, spiritual things or holy things. And there's a balance in that, isn't there? You know, I've heard the phrase that some people are so spiritually minded, there are no earthly good. And I think that's right. Uh, I think that uh, some people uh, are so spiritually minded that they're no earthly good. And then also that some are so carnal or they're so fleshly, they're so, so, so concerned about earthly things that they're, no spiritually, they're not spiritually good. And I think scripture teaches a balance in that really because God has given every, every created thing that he's created for us that's good for our pleasure. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. But sometimes we get the sense that, uh, that man, our, our thoughts are just on carnal things. Our thoughts are on things that, that are just passing away. And again, I'm not talking about blatantly sinful things. I'm just talking about where our pleasures and where our sustenance comes from. And so here's what I think the psalmist is is really grieving over in the sense that he recognizes that that his heart, his mind is set on, on lower things. My heart is set on earthly things. Uh, we have to be careful around Christmas time, right? Because we get so engaged and engrossed in earthly things. Again, I love giving gifts at Christmas. I, I love the Christmas season. But if I'm not careful, my focus becomes those things rather than, uh, than, than what they need to be. You get the drift here? Maybe you're this morning waking up and saying, God, I, I just feel so distant from you. God, I, I feel like my mind is just on carnal things. Well, that's a good thing because that means the Holy Spirit is active in our lives and in our hearts, drawing us to him. He says, again, my soul clings to the dust. And then he prays, God, give me life according to your word. We spoke yesterday about life and, and real life. And so here he's saying, God, give me life according to your word. He recognizes that, that real life, the fullness of life, the, the completeness of life comes through God and who God is and who God has revealed himself to be through his word. And his word nourishes our soul. He says in verse 26, when I told of my ways, you answered me. God, when I was really honest with you and said, God, my mind and my heart are focused on earthly things. God, give me, give me life through your word. Then God answered me. He, he answered me, and, and I said, God, teach me your statutes. You see, it's when, it's when we humble ourselves before the Lord, when we're honest with God and say, God, this is where I am. God, will you help me? That's when God answers. I'm convinced that, that when, when we half-heartedly express desires to God that might be Christianese, that doesn't move God one bit whatsoever. But when we say, God, 
I am just so drawn to the things of the world. God, I'm so drawn away from you. God, I recognize that in light of you, God, this is where I am. God loves the humble, but he despises the proud. And God answers and he responds to that. Then he prays in verse 27, God, make me understand the way of your precepts. I know that I can't understand them on my own. God, I need the Holy Spirit because God, the things of God are spiritually discerned. God, make me understand the way of your precepts and I will meditate on your wondrous works. Now here's the second expression in verse 28 that he makes. First he said in verse 25, my soul clings to your dust. And then in verse 28, he says, my soul melts away for sorrow. That's really uh, uh, Matthew chapter five, verses one and verses and verse two, right? Where Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, bankrupt in spirit, that they know that that they, they are absolutely bankrupt spiritually. And then blessed are those, verse 2, Matthew chapter 5, who, who mourn. And the psalmist is saying, God, my soul is going after earthly or low things. And then in verse 28, he says, God, my, my soul melts away of sorrow. In the Hebrew, this is not like a downpour. This is more of a slow, drizzling rain when he says, my soul melts away. It's constant. It's consistent. And he's saying, in, in this continual state, God, God, my soul is melting away for sorrow. He's sorrowful over his condition. Again, God loves a humble heart, but God resists a proud and a haughty heart. So let's have a humble heart before God. God, my soul melts away. Strengthen me according to your word. Now, God, build me up in your word. God, help us that we don't become haughty and proud and think that we're so spiritual that, that, that God just loves us because we're so spiritual. That is pride. That's a haughty spirit. God, help us not to ever be that way but to continually keep us before him in humility, recognizing that apart from him, man, we are nothing. And apart from him, we would go the way of the worst and vilest sinner. We need the Holy Spirit of God. Can anybody say an amen to that? So he says, God, then verse 29, God put false ways far from me and graciously teach me your law. It could be translated, God, put lying far away from me. Now, it's not necessarily that we need to interpret that, that he was addicted to lying. But what he's saying here is, God, I find my way traveling down false ways, ways that are not truth, ways that are not based on truth. We all find ourselves at times falling along those ways of the lie, believing the enemy's lies, um, this morning, I woke up with a feeling that, feeling that uh, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, I uh, guess I'll go and eat some worms, you know? Um, but, but I had to recognize and realize that those are feelings that I have and you have on occasion. Um, but but it's, it's who we are in Christ. God has made us the righteousness of of God in Christ. We're his beloved children. We have full access to the throne of grace, Hebrews, to receive mercy in our time of need. And so God, keep faults. We can so easily deceive ourselves. We need the Holy Spirit. God, keep, keep us away from false paths. Keep us away from paths that are not true, paths that are not right. And God, graciously teach me your law. God, in your grace, discipline me. Train me according to your word, is what he says here. And then he resolves in verse 30. I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I set your rules before me. It is a choice. It's kind of a two-edged sword there. Because we so desperately need the Holy Spirit of God to cause us, to draw us, to walk in his ways. But at the same time, we have to resolve and be willing to follow after Christ. And we need his spirit. We can't do it on our own. 
But on our own, we make the resolution. We have a free will to choose, God. And here the psalmist says, I have chosen the way of faithfulness. I cling, verse, 20, verse 31, I cling to your testimonies. I hold them near to me. I hold them near to my breast. God, I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Let me not be put to shame. We might translate that, let me not bring shame upon myself. You see, holding on, holding true, holding near to our hearts, God's testimonies are a sure way not to bring shame into our lives, shame into our loved ones' lives, and shame to the name of Christ. Keep your ways before me, O oh God. Let me not forget you. I will run the way of your commandments when you enlarge my heart. I love that. God, I'll run toward your commandments when you enlarge my heart. Let it be our prayer today that God would enlarge our hearts, that God would grow our hearts for his word, for a love for him, for meditating on his word, for absorbing his word, walking in obedience to his word. I pray that God would bless you today, that his face would shine on you, that you'd have a great and glorious day. I love you. I continue to pray for you as you come to my mind. Um, Let's worship the Lord and let's pray and ask God, God, give me an opportunity to share Christ with somebody today. And one way you can do that is right now, hit that share button on Facebook. Hit it and share it with others. We never know what a passerby might scroll and see and be encouraged by the word of God today or might be drawn by hearing his word. Faith comes by hearing and that of the word of God. I love you. I pray God's blessings on you. Have a great day.